Well, I think we can get started. Um, as others join, we'll welcome them. But um, first of all, I just want to say it's so wonderful to see everyone and um, have you all join us for our what we hope will be our first annual MDIBL homecoming. And unfortunately, we're sad not to have you all here with us in Salisbury Cove. It's a beautiful afternoon here, but very excited that we're able to utilize technology and connect with all of you. And I have a feeling that um, Zoom will be part of our lives for quite a while to come. And so that I think also opens up some opportunities for us to stay connected and make it a little easier. You don't necessarily have to travel to Bar Harbor to be uh, connected to the lab. So we're really excited about that. And we have a great presentation lined up um, today for you. And so I wanna just get started and um, begin by introducing you to Chris Signolfi, who is a former student at MDIBL. He was with us for several summers beginning in 2001. And Chris is a relatively new member of our board of trustees. And so this initiative is largely um, something that he was, was very much behind and responsible for uh, kicking off. So Chris, a thank you to you for your enthusiasm for connecting with fellow students and former alums of MDIBL and bringing everyone together. Well, thanks, Jerry. And uh, I just want to offer uh, my thanks to you to putting, putting it together, my thanks to today's presenters, and a welcome to everybody joining us um, for the launch of this inaugural MDIBL alumni homecoming. Um, as Jerry mentioned, my name is Chris Tignolfi, and I'm a recent addition to the MDIBL board. Um, as a Maine native, a former student uh, scientist, and, and now an MDIBL trustee, I'm very excited about this alumni outreach effort. Uh, becoming a more formal initiative, and to have the chance to update you all about MDI's current programs and key focus areas. Uh, you know, from the time I was a student at the lab nearly 20 years ago, a lot has changed, uh, but the, the lab remains true to its core focus on, you know, world-class science. Um, there, we've resumed the summer uh, program, so there's a, a renewed focus on education. It's become a full year uh, round laboratory. The physical plant has changed quite a bit. Um, Jerry's doing a tour on Friday. Um, and so, you know, I encourage you over the next couple of days to participate in the alumni program uh, we, we, we have uh, out here. It will be available on the website as well. If you're not able to join everything this week, it'll be available under record um, for you to look at then. But it's my distinct pleasure to introduce MDIBL's current uh, president, Dr. Herman Holler. It was a pleasure of the board to um, announce and appoint Dr. Holler as president in 2018. He's highly esteemed for his work as a physician scientist specializing in kidney disease and diabetic complications. Dr. Brawler, Dr. Holler brings an extensive knowledge and appreciation for the work of MDIBL to his position as president. He's been a visiting scientist at the lab since 1998. He has maintained a full research laboratory at MDIBL since 2007. He received his medical degree from Free University of Berlin and completed postdoctoral uh, post work at Yale University, published more than 700 peer-reviewed articles, holds six worldwide patents, and has founded four biotech companies. He's received many honors and awards, serves on numerous advisory boards, and is generally just a very nice man. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce him uh, to you today to share not only his enthusiasm for the lab, but his personal experience in treating patients with COVID uh, and conducting research to understand the biology of this disease and developing potential treatments to help minimize the threat of this devastating pandemic. So with that, I'll turn things to you, Dr. Holler. Thank you very much, Chris, uh, for the kind introduction, especially for the nice man. We're not going to talk a lot about COVID-19 today, although it's in the background. Uh, it um, would have been much nicer to sit together under the tent on Star Point. And before that, I would have liked to show you what has changed at MDIBL. Chris already uh, alluded to some changes, power plan, but new buildings. You can see here, on our first slide, the education building uh, where we could have stand on the balcony overlooking Frenchman's Bay. But I think this is our first annual meeting, welcoming, and we'll have many more 
in the future. And this will give us the opportunity to show you around and to tell you what we are doing. I'll try to, uh, in a nutshell, talk about what we are doing at the moment and uh, what, in which way MDIBL is developing. The event is happening in conjunction with our 2020 student symposium. And many of you recall the student symposium. Many of you recall the wonderful times they had in the lab when they had to work hard, long hours in the morning and then till the evening. But in between, there was always time for a hike or a swim in the ocean. And I have to admit, it's such a lovely day. I have been swimming in the ocean between 12 and 12.30. That's about <clears throat> what you do when you work here and you don't have lunch. The student symposium, which will start uh, tomorrow uh, online for the first time is uh, the culmination of our summer fellowship program. You can see here some of the students. We are very proud that we had, even during these difficult times, 23 research fellows this year. Six are you undergrads, 13 from the INBRI program. Most of you know well for high school students. We had 16 mentors. And this already tells you because our visiting scientist program is way down this year that the mentors are now the faculty, the year round faculty we have here. Six main institutions send their students. And I, uh, you can see here on the right hand side, Claire, she's one of our students. And uh, we went through her poster and her presentation yesterday. And I really look forward what we are going to here. The students send us pictures of them working from home. Uh, the undergrad students, as I already mentioned, are funded through INBRI uh, and NSF. They have not experienced MDIBL in reality. But I think they enjoyed their time with us in the lab. And for me, it's hard to imagine that some of the students they are now so deep in their projects, but they have never held a pipette and they have never done the real experiments. So this will change hopefully in the coming years and we'll come back, not to the original, but to a blended form, because we have also learned that some of the communication forms we have changed now are not so bad altogether. And MDIBL, we always learn and we are there for change. So we'll see how this develops. So it is my pleasure to officially welcome our 2020 students to the MDIBL Alumni Association. You, the students, are now part of an international cadre of scientists, physicians, teachers, Entrepreneurs, yes, we have now more entrepreneurs and business professionals. And Chris Ignolfi is one of the examples how you can have a career in a very different area when you start in one of the labs at MDIBL <laughs> during the summer. Could I have the next slide? So this is our vision. The question is, uh, it's now 12 years since we have changed from a uh, summer program only and visiting scientists program at the lab mostly to a year-round faculty. But we still have the vision of recruiting outstanding faculty and staff. You're aware this is more difficult when you're a year-round institution on the coast of Maine. But we are doing well, and I'll show you in a moment our outstanding faculty. We are investing in technology and innovation. For the last 125 years, MDIBL has been known for outstanding technology and innovation. You may not know that cell cultures were first introduced at MDIBL even before 1920. And a long list 
of innovations, technical and biological innovations have taken place at MDIBL and we are following uh, this history. We expand our opportunities for visiting scientists. Our precious campus with the cottages and we have started uh, to renovate the cottages uh, to accommodate more scientists, more visiting scientists in the future, but they are not only visiting scientists, uh, visiting scientists in, within their own program, they are now visiting scientists program with our faculty. So they center around our faculty members and the research groups we have here. We are strengthening our research training programs. Uh, main MDIBL has always been famous for sparking the enthusiasm for research in young students. And this is what we are going to keep, uh, what we will keep doing. We build partnerships throughout Maine and beyond. Uh, and uh, I'm very proud that our relationships, both with the Jackson Laboratory, the College of the Atlantics, we had during the COVID-19 crisis, uh, weekly calls where we exchanged problems, we discussed, and this brought us really together, but also with the University of Maine, where we are starting now a COPRI program, and uh, we are working more closely together with the other main institutions than we did a couple of years ago. And lastly, we are translating our research. These days, we have to make the results we have in the lab. And you know that we have a long history here as well, for well, Marin did this years ago, that we have to translate this into patents. This afternoon, we are submitting one patent on new diagnostics in aging, but we also host small companies on campus and we are one of the biomedical hubs in Maine. Next slide. I would like briefly to go through the main areas and what has changed over the last year. Here you see the faculty, both old, present and new ones. On the left-hand side, Ian Tremon, professor uh, from Harvard. He is now our scientific director. He's taking care of all the junior scientists. Uh, then we have James Godwin working on axolotl on limb regeneration. And below that, you can see our new Indian colleague, Brayak Muravala. And between Brayak and James, we are now one of the leading centers of lymph regeneration and axolotl. Jim Kaufman, most of you know, working on zebrafish as well. And then on the right hand side, we have uh, the researchers in aging and uh, Eric Rogers and uh, the Rollins Lab and uh, Sam Beck and Dustin, who is really spearheading research in very novel areas. Uh, of non-membranous organelles. I'm really looking forward to tell you more about this in the future and our researchers are looking forward to take your hand and guide them through their labs and their programs. We are recruiting more and we need your support, next slide please, for our new faculty members. We want to have uh, a research group uh, working on aging model organisms, new model organisms, which we have started. And this is shown here in this slide, our new animal models. You can see here zebrafish, but on the upper left-hand side, that's the African turquoise killifish. And that combines old and new. Old, because killifish has been researched on for decades at MDIBL. But the African turquoise killifish is a model of aging, of accelerated aging, so we're using this fish to unravel problems of kidneys, problems of brain and other organs in aging animals. 
You see C. elegans, the blue worms in the middle. Drosophila, uh, we have researched on it. We'll come back to this. You see the axolotl on the lower right-hand side. How many axolotls do you think we have at MDIBL? You may be astonished. 900 at the moment. And they are uh, a couple of inches long. And uh, so it will be interesting when you come next time to bring you down into our animal facility with all these fascinating animals. And last but not least, we are starting in organoids. You see here the stem cells which differentiate into different uh, organs. And we're working with kidney organoids, but also others. And we're using these organoids also to teach students in the novel methodology of understanding aging and regeneration. Next slide, please. And new technology. Next week, and you can see that we are not only surviving the pandemic, but we are very active. Next week, we will install our new microscopes. We will have a size microscope, uh, which has been given to us by both sponsorship and the NIH, 1.2 million. But we are already thinking of the next generation of uh, custom-made microscopes which will bring MDIBL not only uh, to the same level as MIT and other institutions, but one level, one step further, so that people can come and work with us on novel technology. On the left-hand side, you see single cell analysis. We have recruited specialists for single cell analysis. And this brings us to a very important topic, and this is bioinformatics and artificial intelligence. There is worldwide a need to use artificial intelligence to understand the molecular mechanisms. And we have been doing this when we were sitting out in Starpoint, Monday morning lecture. It was already difficult, but we'll add a new dimension to these difficulties uh, by teaching students and recruiting research groups in artificial intelligence. Next slide, please. In order to recruit more researchers, we have to invest in lab space. We have built over the last 20 years two research buildings, and at the moment we do not think, we may do in the future, but not for the time being, but we think about renovating Neil, which will house another two research groups. And Karnofsky is also nicely suited. <clears throat> so for the recruitment of new researchers, we need the renovation of these uh, two laboratories. And I think <clears throat> Terry and her crew will come back together with me and ask you for support for our research. Next slide. And last, not least, the campus. About 30 minutes ago, I mentioned to Terry that now we will start renovation of Bowen. You can see Bowen here. It's the proud first building sitting on top of the hill when you enter MBIBL, but it's falling apart. And we have had meetings over the last year. We have a very nice uh, program now from our architects, how to do the historical renovation of Bowen because it's more than 150 years old. But we'll start right now. And we have already started with the other campus cottages. So next time you come, uh, you may either stay in one of these cottages, or at least we'll show you around. And we are slowly going through the whole campus and renovate all the buildings. So within the next couple of years, we'll have a proud campus where we can house the visiting scientists from within the US and international we would like to have. Next one, please. And the research training program was already mentioned. Our high school program is of the highest quality, but we also have to invest in our graduate students and postdocs. The graduate student program is very dear to my heart because this is the next generation of scientists we train. At the moment, we have too few. We only have three 
to four and uh, we will expand. We will have, if things go all right, more than 10. I plan for 12 graduate students by the end of 21. Next one. Sorry. Teddy. Jay, could I have the next one? Yes, sorry, Dr. Heller, hold on. So in 2020, 122 years of discovery. You see the old, you see m more new. Uh, on the right hand side, you see something which is very dear to me, to our history. This is Monday morning lectures. We gave up on Monday morning lectures a couple of years ago. There are several reasons for that, and I don't know whether we'll come back to Monday morning lectures, but what we'll do in the future, we'll combine the best of our tradition of the last 122 years with the best of the modern world, both in technology, science, and education. Our campus will serve the next generation of scientists as a meeting place. This is the place where you, you, you do not only do great experiments, but you have the time to look over the ocean and to gather your thoughts and hopefully have new ideas. And it's also the place where we can spark the enthusiasm for science in the next generation. We can't do this by ourselves. We are a small institution. We have high aims. We want to be known as almost better than Howard Hughes Institute uh, on the coast of Maine. In Germany, our Howard Hughes Institutes are called Max Planck Institutes. And there were a lot of Max Planck research people at MDIBL in the past, and there will be in the future. So outstanding scientific education and outreach programs that create enthusiasm for scientific discovery and relationships that last for generations. Thank you very much for listening. I'm looking forward to our speaker now. And she has worked at MDIBL. And uh, Alison Fundes is from the College of the Atlantic. As I mentioned before, it's great to work more closely together with the College of the Atlantic. And Alison, you experienced this before. Terry Bowers will introduce you and talk about your experiences over the last years with expeditions on the ocean and I'm very much looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Dr. Haller. Um, thank you for the overview. So much has changed at MDIBL just since I've been here, so I'm certain that for many of you uh, the changes seem pretty um, immense and, and drastic as well, but the good news is the culture of MDIBL is very much the same and that's part of what uh, we want to celebrate with all of you this week in terms of being able to reach out and connect um, with those who were here at the same time and sharing memories that seem to span generations. Um, many of the same experiences I think no matter when you're at MDIBL are shared among all those different uh, age groups so that's a fun thing. One of the things for me, having been here for about 20 years, is it's so much fun to watch and learn and see what our students do. So we have them with us for a pretty short period of time, perhaps one, maybe two or three summers. But we always love to um, sort of watch where people go, where their career tracks lead them. And the same is, is definitely true with tonight's speaker, uh, Allison Fundus. And as Dr. Haller mentioned, Allison um, graduated her, received her undergraduate degree from the College of the Atlantic. And during that time, she spent time at MDIBL as a student. And so um, she credits that experience in part with her enthusiasm for science. And that's exactly what we love to hear in terms of the role that our education program programs play in capturing that spirit, that enthusiasm for scientific discovery. So we are thrilled to have her with us this evening to share a bit about where her scientific uh, 
career has led her and how she um, is really emulating some of those same principles that are reflected in our education programs here in terms of her work to inspire uh, that same kind of enthusiasm for scientific discovery with uh, the students that she engages with. So I want to just tell you a little bit about her role. Um, she is currently the Chief Operating Officer for the Ocean Exploration Trust, where she leads the development and management of the organization's ocean exploration and outreach activities and teams. She pulls from a diverse background in scientific education and extensive seagoing experiences to engage the science community, students, and the public in telepresence-enabled expeditions toward aboard the Trust Exploration Vessel Nautilus. Since 2006, she has led or participated in more than 50 expeditions utilizing a variety of deep sea technologies and submersibles in the eastern, north, and south Pacific Ocean, Gulf of Mexico, Gulf of California, Caribbean, and the Mediterranean Sea. Before joining o Ocean Exploration Trust in 2013, Alice worked with the National Science Foundation's Ocean Observatories Initiative in the at the University of Washington. In her role there, she participated in addition to developing resources and programs for students. I just missed that totally, sorry about that. <laughs> in her role there, she participated in the planning and installation of the US's largest cable seafloor observatory in addition to developing resources and programs for students that utilize the observatory's real-time data. Allison is a former high school chemistry and biology teacher and remains passionate about making authentic opportunities in STEM available to students, educators, and the public through Ocean Exploration Trust. So Allison, welcome back to MDIBL. We're thrilled to have you here with us, with us this evening and look forward to hearing more about your work at Ocean Exploration Trust. Thank you so much, Jerry and Dr. Holler. I'm very pleased to be here and thank you so much for the invitation. Well, um, thank you again, um, and I'm really happy to be imagining us all on MDI right now. Um, so I'm so grateful for the opportunity uh, to share with you a little bit about my work, and I'll start by briefly introducing you to the path that Jerry uh, just mentioned um, from I, where I took MDI to where I am today, um, since we didn't get the fortune of getting together in person today. Um, so 18 years ago, uh, I was a junior in college uh, on MDI at the College of the Atlantic. Um, and in 2002, I spent a summer with my advisor there, Chris Peterson, uh, at MDIBL, along with his collaborators and, and other students. Um, and this is us in Northeast Creek, uh, seining for mummy chogs. So our, our primary research project that summer was looking at sex and size variability in mummy chogs. Uh, within the creek. Um, so really uh, the hands-on experience and the collaborative research uh, experience that I gained at the lab there in the field really helped cement my love for field science, uh, which I continued to pursue under Chris's amazing guidance at COA and then subsequently through, through grad school and my career. Um, as Jerry mentioned, uh, I did have, uh, I did dabble in uh, teaching for a little bit. So my, uh, in addition to, to field science, my other passion has always been teaching. Uh, so when I first started with College of the Atlantic, I kind of had this direction of, I'm going to, I'm going to be a teacher. I'm going to teach science. I'm going to teach art. Wasn't quite sure, uh, but COA helped me figure that out. Um, but so shortly after graduating, uh, I began teaching biology and chemistry uh, at a school in Nashville, which is where I grew up. Um, and as much as I loved it, um, I had the itch to get back into the field um, and I, I knew that I, I wanted some more research experience and then potentially I'd bring that back to teaching later in my career. Um, so I, I satisfied that itch um, and I, I landed a position contracting uh, with Woods Hole Oceanograph Oceanographic um, Institution, working as a technician um, with this uh, towed camera system, uh, which is pictured in the left there with uh, my advisor at the time, Dan Frenari, um, and us posing next, next to it. Um, so it's a bit of a Frankenstein of uh, a towed camera system. Um, so we primarily were working off of uh, Wood, Woods Hole's oceanographic uh, research ship, RV Atlantis, um, which is a primary platform, platform for the submarine Alvin. Um, so Alvin's only really deployed during the day and it recharges its batteries at night. And to take uh, the most advantage of the very expensive ship time, uh, we would utilize uh, the overnight hours to tow this camera behind the ship and image the seafloor just so we're maximizing the potential of the ship. So that gave me a very different look uh, at field research. 
Um, and the work there was primarily focused on looking at volcanic processes along fast spreading areas of the mid-ocean ridge. Um, and for those of you that are not geologists in the room, uh, the mid-ocean ridge is a, the 70,000 kilometer feature around the world uh, where much of the Earth's volcanic activity takes place. And you can see this in, in the gray areas that uh, intersect all the ocean basins there. So this is where the tectonic plates are, are moving apart from one another. Um, and, and a big pivot from my previous work at MDIBL and COA, I absolutely fell in love with geology and specifically deep sea volcanic systems. Um, so that really became a catalyst um, for me going back to school to pursue a master's in geology. Um, and I continued working with Woods Hole um, in this camera system and continued going to sea. Um, and that's when I, I helped map and characterize both, both visually and geochemically the first known repeat eruption along the mid-ocean ridge, uh, mid ridge system. Um, so we, we know a lot about how volcanic eruptions occur on land, uh, but since it's so difficult to observe them as they're happening in the deep sea, there's still so much that we don't know. Um, and that really led me to my next jump, um, which was over to uh, the University of Washington. Um, and when I, when I first joined the University of Washington, Washington, they were just starting this uh, decades-long program of, of planning this effort with the National Science Foundation to design and build the world's largest subsea cabled observatory. So we can really look at these long scale phenomenon um, in real time 24 seven without having to rely on ships going to sea. And while I was there, my primary focus was helping to design the network that would observe an active seamount or uh, underwater volcano that would provide 24 seven mon monitoring of sen sensors and instruments via fiber optic cable back to shore. Uh, and we wanted to do it in a way that when the volcano next erupted, uh, it wouldn't pave over all of our sensors and equipment uh, with lava. So um, if you're in geology, you know, you know, you can't really predict volcanoes uh, all that well, but you know, we, we, did, we did our best and um, it has captured some really amazing data um, since it's been deployed in the last, last years. Um, alongside that, I also continued my passion in education and start, started up a program that uh, brought students to sea with us and also de designed a curricula for K-12 educators um, to use all of the real-time observatory data that was coming um, so uh, educators can use them in classrooms. And then from there, um, I took a position with the Ocean Exploration Trust, um, and that's what I'll largely talk about today. Uh, and I've been working with Ocean Exploration Trust since 2013, um, where I've really been able to couple my passion for, for science education um, and facilitating field research. Um, so the Ocean Exploration Trust is a 501c nonprofit. Uh, we're primarily funded through federal grants uh, and private donations. Um, and we were founded in 2008 by Dr. Robert Ballard, um, which many of you probably recognize um, as being one of the, the team leads for the uh, discovery of the Titanic wreck. Um, but what he claims as his most uh, impactful scientific contribution was the discovery of hydrothermal vents uh, in the Galapagos in 1977. So when he founded uh, Ocean Exploration Trust, he did so with uh, kind of three tenets of, of, our, of our mission. And that's really to go uh, and explore the ocean where it's really poorly understood, where it's poorly mapped and poorly observed. Um, and parallel with that, to really raise up a very impactful and engaging STEM education program, and then also develop tools and technologies that are going to be able to uh, allow us to effectively and efficiently explore the global ocean. So at the Trust, uh, we own and operate uh, this beauty. Uh, so this is Exploration Vessel or EV uh, Nautilus. Um, she's 64 meters long uh, and can house uh, 48 people on board. Uh, the ship was originally built in 1957. Um, so it's a bit of a long story that I won't go into, but we do think it was a former uh, East German spy ship. Um, but we require, acquired the ship in 2009 and renamed her uh, after having made significant upgrades for both operations uh, and making it very comfortable uh, research ship to sail on. Uh, one of the early upgrades that we made was to install a multi-beam sonar on the hull of the ship, and that enables us to map 
the sea floor at high resolution up to 7,000 7, meters depth. And, and just to give you a picture of, of what that actually means, um, this is a snapshot from Google Earth uh, from some islands off the west coast of Mexico. Um, so this is satellite-based mapping data. Um, and the equivalent of the resolution of this data would be like taking a table, putting a bunch of different objects on it, and then draping a thick blanket over it all. You can't really tell what's underneath that blanket. So we bring our system in to take high resolution, uh, to make high resolution maps with the data. Um, and that really allows us to take that metaphorical, metaphorical blanket off the seafloor so we can really look at the geological terrain in, in much greater detail. Uh, that subsequently allows us to go in and map uh, areas and really identify areas that we want to go and explore more with some of our other assets, which are deep sea robotic vehicles. To date, um, with our multi-beam system, uh, we have mapped over half a million square kilometers uh, of the seafloor. Sea um, and to give you uh, some scale, uh, that's the equivalent about, of about six mains um, in terms of, of surface area. Um, so it, it's a great contribution to, to the larger effort within the oceanographic community to a program called Seabed 2030. Um, and that's, you know, a lot of collaboration within the oceanographic community and also industry partners that have uh, similar systems on their ships. Um, and the aim of that program is to fully map the world's oceans in high resolution by, by the year 2030. Um, this is our primary asset that we rely on for exploratory expeditions. Um, and this is our remotely operated vehicle, or ROV. Um, so it is an un unmanned or unpersoned vehicle that's controlled from the ship, piloted by uh, joysticks and, and controls on board the ship. Um, it's capable of going to depths of 4,000 meters. Um, and for those of you that are familiar with uh, Mount Desert Island, that's equivalent of eight and a half Cadillac mountains stacked on top of one another. Um, it is a two-bodied ROV system, uh, which means we've got kind of two, two ROVs that work in tandem. Uh, one is essentially a clump weight that takes up the motion of the sea surface and the ship and allows the, the main ROV, which is ROV Hercules with the yellow uh, on it, um, to essentially operate like a dog on a leash on underneath that. So it kind of allows it a lot of flexibility. Um, they're both equipped with high definition cameras, which give us really stunning views of both the seafloor and any territory that we're exploring. Um, and then the main ROV has uh, various sampling capabilities um, that we're able to deploy through the robotic arms that we can manipulate from, from the ship. Um, and that enables us to take uh, you know, pretty much any sample that you can think of that we might come across on the seafloor, ranging from biological samples to geological. Uh, we often work in maritime history and archaeological arche samples. Um, and then we can also take uh, chemical and, and water, water samples as well. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we often work with groups that um, are very interested in more of the R&D, so the research and development projects. Um, this is just one example of that where we partnered with NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory uh, to work on this a uh, pretty scary looking device called the Gecko Gripper. Um, and its, its future deployment is intended to help uh, uh, NASA potentially drill on asteroids. So we often partner with researchers at NASA because the deep sea is a very harsh environment um, and it can be a proxy for studying other ocean worlds. Um, so we can often use it as a, a test bed for you know, things that might eventually be deployed in space, which are uh, much more expensive to get into space than they are into the deep sea. Uh, we also bring uh, various partner vehicles on board. Um, this is just one example. This is an autonomous surface uh, vessel. And so it's a small mapping vessel. Um, and this can really uh, ad be an advantage to us uh, when we're in very remote areas um, because it can, it can map very shallow terrain that the vessel can't necessarily get to with its own system. So it just allows us to expand our footprint uh, of what we're able to explore. Uh, we, so we kind of uh, have two flavors of exploration at Ocean Exploration Trust, and we divide it into two buckets, and we call it applied exploration and basic exploration. 
Um, and the applied exploration is more of the hypothesis driven work. So that's where a researcher might charter our, our ship or might have a very targeted research program um, that they want to go and explore a certain phenomena or they've got, you know, a, a question that they want to answer. And, and one of our primary partners for some of our applied exploration are uh, the NOAA National Marine Sanctuaries. So these are known areas. We've got boundaries within marine protected areas, um, but they haven't necessarily been mapped or really visually characterized. Um, so they haven't done a full baseline assessment of what they have in terms of biology or geology within these areas. So we would partner with the National Marine Sanctuaries to both inform them what's in their existing boundaries, uh, but also what might be just outside of their boundaries that might help um, establish uh, expansion or, or establishing new sanctuaries in, in the future. So just really helps them uh, inform some of their management decisions. Um, our, our bread and butter is really our basic exploration efforts, and this is largely done uh, with NOAA as well through the Office of Exploration and Research. Um, and this work is work that we do on behalf of the broader oceanographic community. So when we're out doing basic exploration, it is not for any one researcher or any one PI. Um, we, we really do this on behalf of the entire community. And we also make the data and uh, all of the samples not proprietary. So they go into repositories um, and all of our data, all of our video is free, freely available to any researcher, student, or educator that's interested in it for publication or research. So through both of those uh, kind of buckets of, of exploration, uh, these are all the sites that we've uh, deployed expeditions since 2009. Um, so we started, when we first acquired the ship, uh, we acquired it in the Mediterranean. So we spent a couple of years in the Mediterranean. Um, a lot of that work was largely focused on ancient shipwrecks. Uh, in 2014, we came across the Atlantic, um, spent a fair amount of time in the Gulf of Mexico and Caribbean Sea. And then in 2015, uh, we crossed the Panama Canal and have been in the Pacific ever since. And we, we plan to keep the ship in the Pacific uh, for the foreseeable future. And I'll just share with you a couple of our, our recent findings um, and discoveries. Um, this is one of our exciting discoveries that we came across uh, just last year uh, off Monterey Bay, California. Um, so this is a, a whale fall. Um, so this is a site where a whale had deceased and, and fallen to the seafloor. So this image that you're seeing is taken from the camera from our, our clump ROV. Um, and then this is what it would have looked like from, from the ROV that was up close. So you can see that these create just amazing habitats um, as the animals are coming in and, and feeding off of that dead whale. Um, so just really stunning habitats. Uh, this was another example. Uh, this is a really amazing sponge garden uh, off Haida Gwaii in British Columbia. Um, so just a, a really incredible and, you know, somewhat alien landscapes um, that, we're, that we come across. And this is more of the, the close-up view of what that would look like. And then sometimes we see the very rarely seen um, because we're going to unexplored areas. Um, this is one of the really exciting uh, finds that we made in 2018, I believe. Um, this is off, off of San Benedicto Island in Mexico. Um, this is a type of jelly called deep staria enematica, um, given, you know, it kind of, it's named after its rarity and how, how, uh, how unlikely it is to be come across uh, when, you're, when you're exploring. Um, sometimes we see the seemingly very unrealistic, um, you know, there's some of these uh, critters and, and these, are, these are the types of finds um, that really get the public engaged. I mean, this, this one really kind of uh, got very popular on social media. Um, we've got people with Etsy shops and everything with, with fabric designed after this uh, googly-eyed uh, squid. Um, and then sometimes we find uh, the very large as well. So this was a case of somebody exploring us rather than us exploring them. Uh, this was uh, we were diving, actually looking at methane bubbles coming up from the seafloor, natural methane seeps. Um, and as we were doing a tran transect up through the water column, we had this juvenile sperm whale come and investigate and be very curious about the ROVs. Um, so we just kind of halted all operations and, and let them explore uh, what we were doing at the time. Just some pr pretty incredible sightings that, that you don't necessarily 
go out looking for. Um, we also uh, do a lot of work with maritime historians um, and archaeologists. Um, now that we're in the Pacific, we're, we're doing a lot of uh, work to, to look at a lot of the World War II uh, wrecks that have happened in the Pacific. Um, this is one of those examples. This is the USS Independence. It was a World War II uh, aircraft carrier um, that was deployed during the war. Um, but more notably, after the war, it uh, was um, one of the targets that was positioned for Operations Crossroads, which was the atomic bomb test at Bikini Atoll. So this particular vessel was stationed about a half a mile from ground zero of that well-known explosion um, during those tests. Um, so this is what it looked like in the aftermath of that. So it didn't, it did not sink um, during, during those tests. Um, it was eventually towed to the San Francisco Bay Area and scuttled or purposely sank um, in 1951. Um, and it's within an area that's now a National Marine Sanctuary. So within our work with the National Marine Sanctuaries, we went to take a look at it for, for the first time since it had been scuttled. Um, so in 2016, we got the first look at it um, since 1951. And still very much intact, including an aircraft that was still below decks, um, still secured to the deck. Um, but now it's a very impressive sponge habitat. Um, so just pretty interesting looks in terms of both the maritime history side, but also the biological side. Um, for, so for a lot of ships that are going out to sea and doing similar work, um, the only people to see all of this and contribute to the research are, are those that are on board. Um, so one of my absolute favorite parts of, of what we do is that we stream it live 24-7 so researchers, students, educators, and the public can take part in our expeditions while we're at sea. Um, so this has become especially valuable in a time like this where we're going to see and are trying to you know, safely keep everybody um, on shore to the extent possible. And so this is um, our main platform. So we have our, our website and this is where we stream um, everything. So we have video and audio uh, going out over our website so people can listen to both the operational and scientific discussions. Um, but we also have a participatory aspect to really invite the general public in um, to really engage in that conversation as well. So anybody can submit a question um, and we're in the control van on the ship operating the vehicles and also monitoring all of those questions coming in from, from people on shore. So it's not just an expedition for those of us that are on the ship, it's an expedition for everybody that's following along with us. Um, so this is a view of that ROV control room where we operate the vehicles from. Um, so any given time, we've got the ROV pilots, we have video engineers, scientists, navigators, and then also educators and students um, participating in some of our at-sea programs, which, which I'll mention in a little bit. Um, so one of the key strengths of, of telepresence-enabled expeditions is that we're really able to rely on expertise, expertise from individuals that are not at sea with us. Um, so we can call on experts as we make discoveries. So we might not have the expert in a room as we stumble across a new, potentially new species. We can look up who um, that person might be, call them in, um, say, hey, can you tune into the website and, and help us out? Um, in one case, we had someone uh, from a flight that, that was on a flight connected to the plane's Wi-Fi. Um, actually directing a sampling effort happening at 3,000 meters deep while they were 30,000 feet in the air. Um, so very effective telepresence there. Um, but beyond the science community, um, it's incredibly important to convey the significant uh, contributions deep sea exploration um, can make on the next generation and also the hook it can serve in engaging youth in STEM fields and career exploration. Um, so our ultimate goal of telepresence is to really inspire and train the next gener generation of STEM professionals, explorers, um, and the next work workforce. So over the course of the last decade, we've had over 1,500 people from over 45 countries sail aboard Nautilus. And we highlight each and every one of those individuals as a role model to connect with youth that are possibly exploring careers and possibilities that exist within STEM fields. 
So we really kind of center all of our educational and outreach efforts on that role model and mentor aspect. So coupled with that role model approach, um, we have created a suite of educational and outreach programs um, to make, make what we do accessible to any child in the country and around the globe. Um, so we have a variety of at sea programs for students and educators. Uh, when we're in port um, and not in a pandemic, we often host port events where we bring school age students uh, on board the vessel so they can meet the team and, and see all, all of our uh, tools and assets. And then we also develop um, educational resources that are free, freely available to any educators or um, parents um, that might want to download them from our website. Um, since we are so well connected um, to shore, uh, we also conduct a lot of live point, uh, point to point um, connections with, with classrooms and learners all over the world. So we take our role models that are on the ship. So these are the scientists, our educators um, and STEM professionals and, and connect them directly with students in a participatory conversation. And since 2010, we've conducted over 5,000 of these connections. Um, with students all, of, all over the globe. Um, for a more immersive experience, um, we also have established an internship program uh, that has five different tracks on it. Um, so we bring uh, co community college, undergraduate and graduate students out um, through our ocean science, seafloor mapping, ROV engineering, uh, video and filmmaking and navigation internships. And these students spend anywhere between three to five weeks at sea, really embedded um, as part of the operational team and learning what it means to be a seagoing uh, STEM professional. So in any given year, we bring approximately 20 to 25 uh, students out in this program. Uh, we have also established a science communication fellowship where we bring formal and informal educators out to sea with us with the ultimate goal of impacting their students. So they're gonna take that experience, they're gonna become an ocean explorer themselves, and their students are gonna see them through a different lens, um, and they'll be able to empower uh, their students to, to see the hook in ocean exploration and, and STEM disciplines. And we also have a, a growing program to transform STEM to STEAM. Um, so when, we, when we're able to, um, we really like to bring artists to see with us as well, just to give a different perspective um, on, on some of the storytelling that we have. Um, so this is one example of a Philadelphia-based artist, uh, Rebecca Runstein. Um, she came out with us as we were on a mapping expedition um, and she began painting some of the, the mapping data um, as part of her artwork. So those are the education programs that we run. Um, so, so typically, um, so this is a, a map of, of what our season plan is for, for 2020 for this year. So these are the sites that we're anticipating going to with our vessel. Um, in any given year, uh, we're typically out for six to seven months out of the year, and that's broken into 10 to 12 distinct expedition leg legs with various objectives. Um, so the, our plans for this year are continuing to work with the National Marine Sanctuaries along the west coast of the U.S., um, and then also uh, the Office of Exploration and Research, um, and also working with our Canadian partners on a cabled observatory off uh, Vancouver Island. I think I'll spend the rest of the time uh, talking about uh, one of our most notable recent expeditions, um, which was deployed just three days shy of a year ago today. Um, and this was our partnership with National Geographic um, to look for Amelia Earhart's lost uh, Lockheed Electra, which I helped lead with Dr. Ballard and, and the National Geographic last year. Um, so I think everybody knows who Amelia Earhart is or was. Um, but just a little background on her story. Um, so she disappeared during, a, you know, a very highly publicized around the world journey um, in 1937. Uh, she was on one of the last legs of um, her around the world flight. Um, and she disappeared um, as she was leaving Le Le New Guinea. Um, her target at the time was Howland Island. Um, which is pictured on the, on the top right there. You can see the runway that was constructed for her uh, to land on Howland Island. And her only reason for stopping there was to refuel. So she was going to have a Coast Guard ship waiting for her there. 
Um, they were gonna refuel her. She was gonna hop to Honolulu and then eventually to Oakland and complete her journey. Um, just wanna point out the Nicomoreau Island just to the south of that. We'll come back to that in a minute. Um, so along with her for most of uh, the trip was a radio operator and her navigator, Fred Noonan. Um, and due to what they only described as personal issues, uh, her radio operator bailed on the trip right before this last leg. Um, and neither she or Fred really knew how to properly work uh, the radio without him on board. Um, so at the time of her expected arrival to Holland, uh, the Coast Guard ship uh, heard her on the radio and attempted to communicate with her, but it was a one-way conversation. They could hear her, she could not hear them back. Um, but they did hear uh, and record that she had relayed that she was tracking a line of 157-337, looking for the island, um, but she, she never appeared uh, in sight. They could only hear her. Um, so you can see that line that she would have been tracking uh, on, on the map there. Um, this was all before GPS. Um, so they were using dead reckoning uh, to locate their, their targets. Um, so in, in any situation, that is very, very difficult. When you're looking for an island, a small island in the Pacific, um, that's very, very difficult. Um, so it, they, she, they had experienced some navigational challenges throughout their course. Um, for example, in one stop in Africa, they landed 200 miles off course, um, their intended target. So in this case, there was just no room for error. Um, and unfortunately, that's what they experienced. Um, so just from a, a geological perspective, um, just to explain the, kind of that line a little bit. So Howland Island and Nicomoreau Island, which you saw in the previous map, um, as well as some other uh, islands are along a volcanic chain. Um, and they're formed in a very similar fashion to the Hawaiian island chain, uh, which is created by hotspot volcanism. So as long as the, pl the tectonic plate that's overriding that hotspot is moving in a consistent direction, those are gonna be formed on a more or less straight line. Um, and so that, that's what that island chain actually looks like. So, Howland Island, um, there isn't really anything to the north of Howland because it is the oldest island in, the, in that section of the chain. Um, but there are islands to the south of it. Um, so the thought is, knowing this, um, if she had missed Howland a little bit, her inclination would have been to turn right um, if she was trying to find her best chance of landing on another island. So this, uh, again, is Howland Island. Um, so the, on the bottom there, that's the, that's the Coast Guard ship that was waiting for her to refuel. Um, and then the top image on the right, um, that's, that is the existing mapping data that we have for Howland Island. So everything in gray there is, are areas that have been mapped. So not very well mapped. Um, the, the yellow boundary, uh, Howland Island is a US territory. Uh, the, the yellow uh, area around it is the exclusive economic zone. So that's 200 and something nautical miles um, off the coast of Howland Island surrounding it. Um, so a, a lot left to explore there. Um, it's very deep and that's a lot of the reason, uh, and it's very remote and that's a lot of the reason um, for it not being very well mapped yet. Um, so there, there are kind of three primary theories to what happened to Amelia and Fred Noonan. Um, the f one is that they landed somewhere, were captured, became prisoners of war, and there's even theories that the plane is buried under a runway in Saipan. That's not what we do, we're in ocean exploration, so we're not even gonna look at that one. Uh, a second theory is a crash and sink theory. So she got within vicinity of Howland Island. They crashed in, in the open ocean somewhere and the plane subsequently sank. The third theory is that they landed on Nicomoro Island, which is an uninhabited island, which is now part of the Republic of Kiribati. Um, and this is the theory that, that we were looking at last year. Um, and, and it's really on the shoulders of 30 years of research that a group called the International Group for Historic Aircraft Recovery um, had really spent decades uh, overturning. And they had some pretty compelling evidence that led National Geographic and us uh, to pursue this theory. 
um, and we had the proper technology to test it. Um, so the, this is where we uh, deployed our first expedition to, to look for Amelia. So I'll walk you through a, just a couple of the pieces of evidence um, that we were really kind of setting the stage with. Um, this is a pic photograph um, called, pretty well known as the Bevington object. Um, so you can see a ship in the background. Um, that is SS Norwich City, which was uh, wrecked in 1929. Um, it was an Australian freighter going from Mel Melbourne to Vancouver. Um, so it preceded uh, the disappearance of Amelia and Noonan. Um, the, this photograph was taken three months after Earhart and Noonan's disappearance. Um, and it was taken by a British naval officer, um, and they were there evaluating the island for a uh, possible future settlement, settlement for a village and a, and a coconut plantation. So this picture kind of was, it wasn't very notable for a long time. Um, and then uh, this, the TIGAR, this uh, research group that I mentioned before, uh, kind of uncovered this, uh, what, the area that's red and, or circled in red, um, and had that enhanced by some professionals, and if you squint uh, and try hard, uh, you can potentially make that out to, um, to be the landing gear of, of a Lockheed Electra. Um, so I don't, we weren't putting all of our eggs in this basket, but this is just the, one of the pieces of evidence that um, the, the research ahead of us um, was looking at. This is what that same rut looks like today, just for reference, and we'll come back to that in a little bit. One of the other pieces of evidence, uh, and one of my favorites, um, was Betty Klink's notebook. Um, Betty Klink was a 15-year-old girl in St. Pete, Florida, um, that loved shortwave radio. Um, so she would largely just sit with her journal, experiment with shortwave radio, um, and mostly draw kind of Hollywood stars and, and lyrics. Um, but there was one day where she accounted a detailed transcription of what sounded like Amelia in a flooding aircraft with an injured man on board. Um, so these are scans of, of her uh, journal, and there's pieces in, in here, you know, water's high. Um, there's reference to Amelia Putnam, which was Amelia's married name. And then something, uh, reference to saying something sounded like New York. Uh, and the Norwich City wreck was, was there. So maybe she was seeing something that said Norwich City. So, so that was another piece of evidence. Um, another one is uh, the triangulation of radio signals at the time of the disappearance. Um, and in the most case, it was fuzz, um, but there weren't aircraft uh, around her in the air uh, as well. Um, so that was very likely from Amelia's Lockheed. So between Wake Island, Midway Island and Oahu, uh, they all picked up um, various radio signals and that triangulated within the vicinity of Nicomaru Island, which was called Gardner at the time. And then some of the other evidence that had been uncovered by people that had been searching on the island itself um, were some, some artifacts that, that could have been from a woman on, on the island. Um, those included these freckle cream jars, and, and Amelia was known to use to hide her freckles uh, with freckle cream. Um, it found rouge, a zipper, a uh, cosmetic mirror. Um, so, so there was some, some actual items on the island um, that, you know, I think led this previous group to really think that they needed to explore it more. Um, so Nicomaro Island, uh, so just to orient you with, with some of the, the evidence, um, so you've got the Bevington object and the, the wreck of Norwich City um, on, on the right of the image here. Um, and then the arrow that's pointing to the seven site, that's, uh, it's called the seven site because there's a natural clearing in the brush that looks like a seven. Um, but that's where some of those physical uh, items were, were uncovered uh, by groups ahead of us. Um, so these are where we're really focusing our efforts on last year for both sea-based and land-based efforts. Um, so, so in the orange, we had a land team going back to that seven site to continue looking uh, and investigating that area. And then on, on the ship, we were going to largely focus our efforts on areas uh, looking at theories of the Norwich City wreck and the Bevington object um, and that she would have landed um, around there. And our, our thinking for 
positioning our search in this area is that if, if she were to actually land at Nicomoreau Island, she would have had to land against the wind. Um, and just the kind of reference to something that sounds like um, the New York and also the potential landing gear stuck in the reef uh, had us concentrate in this area. Um, so this is what that actual landing spot uh, would have looked like to her. Um, so pretty flat reef. It is, you know, if you're really looking to ditch, um, this, it is a pretty um, decent landing spot potentially. Um, so the landing gear could have gotten caught there, um, or she could have landed on that spot um, and the plane could have, you know, rested until the tide came up. Um, and then the uh, fuel tanks could have filled up, filled up and then the plane uh, would have, or, sorry, the plane could have landed, the tide could have risen, floated the plane off of the reef, and then the plane could have sunk um, once, the, once the fuel tanks filled up with water. So those are the various theories that we were going to look at. Um, so to, to first look at this, um, we, look, we set out to do a, a lot of mapping operations. Um, so we had this autonomous surface vessel that I mentioned previously on board, um, and we really wanted to cover all of the land to the deep sea. Um, so we wanted to ensure that we didn't leave any gaps while we were out there. So we deployed the autonomous surface vessel to map everywhere between the surf break to 250 meters. Um, and then just, you know, for, uh, we also mounted a, a GoPro on the, on the bottom of the hull of it just for additional uh, perspective and vantage points. So we surrounded the entire island here and slowly made our way around the perimeter of it and left no terrain unmapped with, with where this uh, vehicle could reach. Um, so what you're looking at here, the colored areas are, are what's known as bathymetry data or seafloor mapping data. So the red denotes the terrain, um, the shallower terrain, and the cooler colors are the sequ sequentially deeper terrain. So in perspective, this is how steep um, that terrain really looks. So there's no vertical exaggeration on this. So it's a very steep as soon as you uh, drop off of the reef um, of that island. Um, so this is just the mapping data from that autonomous surface vessel um, to about 250 meters deep. And then once we got to 250 meters deep, we, were, we picked that up with our ship-based uh, mapping system. So we used, uh, we took the ship around the island until we had, we had mapped to about seven kilometers or about four and a half miles off the coast of the island. So really had a very comprehensive mapping effort around the island. Um, to ensure that we weren't missing anything between the reef break and the beach, we uh, uh, surveyed the perimeter of the island with, with drones, both mapping and imaging drones. Um, so these are really high resolution images where we can zoom into areas of interest. Um, what you're seeing here is looking down at that Norwich City wreck. So it just gives you, you know, it's a very, very nice clear picture that we could potentially zoom in on areas of interest. So going around the island, um, we could really look in all of the various crevices um, and all of the areas um, that the terrain wouldn't allow um, any of our vehicles or maybe even people to, to get to. Um, and just in case we, we found anything of interest uh, through those efforts, we had a scuba team uh, ready to go in and investigate. Um, we didn't find anything through those efforts, um, but we were able to have some um, enjoyable scuba dives while we were at it. Uh, we also had a land-based team looking at that seven site that I mentioned. So they were continuing to look for, for further artifacts. Um, and along with them came two forensic dogs um, that, they, that had also been on the island before. Um, so it was, it was a very comprehensive land-based effort um, as well going along with, with everything that we were doing. Um, but our, our primary effort for, for what we were really looking at is really focusing on, on the deeper terrain. Um, we were really thinking that you know, if, if the plane did indeed move down slope of the island, um, those heavy engines would have really pulled it down through gravity. Um, so we were really using our primary ROV um, to focus on a visual search. Um, and just to give you some perspective of what we we're up against, um, this is not uh, Nicomoreau, but this is um, Mount Skansen in, in Norway, um, but very similar in terms of what the terrain looked like once we had mapped it and really looked at it. Um, 
so it was really a series of steep scarps and ramps with debris flows and a series of channels. Um, and so we decided that we wanted to take a kind of a geological approach to potentially understanding what might have happened to fragments of Amelia's plain if it did indeed land and move down slope into the deep sea. Um, so, I mean, the main difference in what you see here and what we're up against is Nicomaru Island. Um, the upper portion of the island is capped with white carbonate reef formations, and the lower portion is black lava flows, which eroded fragments of the car carbonate uh, rocks from above would move down um, as a result to mass wasting processes driven by gravity. So, in, in other words, if we were, we thought that if we could follow these uh, mass wasting events down slope, uh, where we were picking up fragments of the carbonate, we might also pick up uh, fragments of a plane that would also be trapped in that same uh, wasting event. So this is what um, it, it kind of looks like at the carbonate zone. So we, we were systematically combing our way down slope within our entire search area. Um, so we moved from the carbonate zone down to more of the volcanic scarp zones. Um, so this is a vol volcanic scarp or cliff. Um, and then you get these ramps of heavily sediment sedimented areas. Um, so it was hours and hours um, of looking at, at images of this through the ROVs. Um, and these are some of the examples of the debris flows through the various zones um, that, we, that we were look, looking through. And when we came across items like this, you know, your natural reaction is to get very excited because it looks like something different than all of those sediment flows and debris flows. Um, but they were largely pieces of the Norwich City. Um, so rusting steel versus the aluminum that we were looking for. Um, but we were also finding uh, human objects like hats or, or trash, unfortunately, um, from either eco-tourists uh, or div divers that had been visiting the island previously. So we came across a lot and a lot of Norwich City debris. No uh, sightings of, of aluminum planes. Um, but in the end, uh, we were able to create a very nice map of, of where the Norwich City debris flow has gone. And that's, that's what this is. This is our data points and all of our observations of, of finding things that are human made um, on, on the seafloor during that search. So we were pretty, after a pretty extensive search, we were pretty convinced that the, the plane was not going to be found um, in that first area that we were looking at. So we decided to go with the theory that maybe the plane stuck on the reef, floated off with the rising tide, um, and then sunk way off uh, the, the coast. So to that um, theory, we had to expand our search area to both the deeper terrain, but we also had to broaden it to try and capture the plane if we could find it. Um, and to do that visually would just take a really long time. Um, so we deployed our side scan sonar, which allows us to look at uh, a greater area of the seafloor at any given time. And this is a very common uh, survey tool when looking for shipwrecks um, or lost planes and in modern history for sure. So we, we side scan sonar uh, a large uh, coverage of area, um, but again, and, and we would have deployed the ROVs had we found anything of interest. Um, but again, uh, we didn't find anything that was compelling enough um, that made us think it was the plane. Um, so, so in the end, um, we had surveyed the entire perimeter um, of the island. We had, of course, mapped all of the terrain. We covered the entire perimeter of the island visually with our ROVs a couple of times, up to about 250 meters, and then really did a thorough systematic look um, at this area where, that we defined as our primary search area. Um, so we can pretty conclusively say, say um, that Amelia's plane is not in this area, <laughs> um, which is a big piece of the puzzle. You know, it's, I mean, that we didn't go home with our tail between our legs by any means, you know, because it, this is one of the, the big theories of where she could have landed, and this is a very important piece to really figuring out uh, where they actually did land. So what's next? Um, so in parallel with this, through the Ocean Exploration Trust, um, we have also been working with partners at the University of Rhode Island, uh, University of New Hampshire, Southern Mississippi, and Woods Hole Oceanographic. Um, and, and May of last year, we were awarded a very large grant through NOAA to stand up what's called 
the Ocean Exploration Cooperative Institute. Um, and this is a five-year grant, uh, renewable up to 10 years, um, to pull all of our expertise and assets together from each of these institutions to create a consortium to really be the nation's center for ocean exploration. Um, this is funded entirely through NOAA, um, and since it's a federal program, it's really concentrated on, on U the U.S. Um, and so our charge over the next five years is to look at the United States exclusive economic zone, which is 200 miles off the coast of any US territory, um, and to both map areas that have been poorly mapped um, and then explore areas that are not well characterized. Um, and that turns out to be an, a pretty extensive uh, amount of the Pacific US EEZ. Um, so what you're seeing here, so the yellow is, are the EEZ boundaries. Um, the pink that you see are areas that are unmapped areas. Um, and if you look at Howland Island, you'll note that it's, and as I mentioned before, it's very um, uh, poorly uh, uh, uncharacterized and, and unmapped. So, so we will be back to Howland Island to pursue, pursue that theory in the future. Um, but through, through this cooperative institute, um, we've got multiple charges, um, and there, there's various themes um, for them. And one of those is to really focus on the coral and sponge habitats um, and really characterize the biodiversity, biodiversity and crit critical habitats within the US EEZ. So areas that we don't necessarily know, you know, the, the breadth of species that live within certain areas. Um, so we're really just going to go in and systematically characterize um, basic baseline surveys for, for what's there. Um, another theme for the Ocean Exploration Cooperative Institute um, is the blue economy. Um, so we're really charged with looking at areas where rich deposits of rare earth metal, metals and critical minerals are. Um, so we can survey what else is living there. Um, and so we can really get ahead of, of the inevitable future of seafloor mining so we can do it in a managed and hopefully more sustainable way. Um, and so to launch this program, uh, we're scaling up with regards to the platforms that we're going to be using and also the, the vehicles that we're going to be using. So these are representative vehicles from, from all of the partners that I, that I mentioned. So rather than just the tools that we've got on board Nautilus, we're going to be bringing all of these assets uh, to the table to really uh, leverage the expertise um, at each of those individual institutions. Uh, we're also going to be taking all of our vehicles and deploying them on other ships. Um, so we've created a, what we call our flyaway ROV system, um, where it's, if it's not efficient or economical to bring Nautilus um, to an area that's a high priority target for exploration within those themes, uh, we'll be able to take our systems and deploy them off of another vessel. So our primary plans uh, for Nautilus for the next few years, um, we're really, uh, we're, the ship is in LA right now getting ready for our 2020 field season. Um, so we'll work our way up the coast of the US this year. Um, and then in 21 and through 24, uh, we're gonna be back in the Central Pacific and really exploring uh, the US territorial islands um, as well as some of the sanctuaries and protected areas uh, within the US EEZ um, for those years. So it'll, it'll certainly take us back to Howland, maybe back to Nicaragua, um, but we're gonna continue the hunt for Amelia because um, we definitely wanna make sure the uh, end of her story is respected and, and well told. So hope that you'll, some of you will join us at sea, uh, either online or through some of our programs. So I will leave it at that. And thank you again so much for having me. Allison, that was fantastic and fascinating. Oh my gosh, amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much. Of course. Some of your imagery of the underwater organism, just amazing. The quality of those images is spectacular. spectacular. Thank you. Wonderful. So I do have a few questions that have come in um, through the chat. And so I'm just going to try to share some of those with you. The first was, um, about your um, artist collaborations and under asking um, sort of how you recruit the artists, how do you, um, you know, wh what does that process look like when you're working with them on the ship? 
Yeah, sure. So, so our artist program falls under the umbrella of the same program for our educators at C. So it's a, uh, we consider artists our informal educators. Um, so we have this formal program and application process for science communication fellows. Um, so it's every fall we put out an announcement for people that are interested in joining the vessel. Um, and so any educator, I mean, whether informal, he could be a docent at a library or a classroom teacher or an artist can apply through that program. Um, and we really, our, our mission in that program is to really empower individuals to be able to tell the complex stories that um, the scientists and engineers have on board the vessel. And so they become, essentially become the liaison between those, those of us on ship and students on shore that are following or public um, that are following, um, but also to really just try and tell these stories in, in meaningful ways that are gonna broaden our reach. Um, the oceanographic community can be pretty uh, isolated and small. Um, and we really, it's, it's very exciting. You know, we often, talk about how much attention NASA gets and planetary science gets versus deep sea exploration. And um, we're just really trying to look for new perspectives and bring, bring any ideas to the table and how we can better communicate it. Fascinating, that's terrific. So the next question is, as a woman in science, have you ever come, again, come up against any barriers to pursuing your passion? Um, there's definitely been challenges. Um, I mean, I've, I've been on expeditions as the only, and this is not very common anymore, thankfully, but um, when I was first getting started, I was on a six week expedition. I was the only female on board. Um, you know, so I think it's just some of those, those isolating experiences more than challenges, but I, I personally have been incredibly fortunate to have um, amazing mentors that have really opened doors for me um, and both a lot of male mentors and, and female mentors um, so so I've really lucked out and you know that's part of my passion and is ensuring that those doors are uh, blown open for, for everybody behind us as well because it's you know really finding the right mentors is, is the key to success I think well I think you sort of touched on our, our third question which is how important is the mentor-mentee relationship in keeping young people, especially women, um, engaged in the field? And I'm just curious about, you know. Yeah, so the, our, our approach to that is pretty much, you know, if you can see it, you can be it. Um, and so we really want to put mentors at the forefront because it, it's not about any one person or about any one scientist doing this. There's always a team involved. Um, and there's always a variety of career paths and uh, lived experiences that are, that are coming into that. So if we kind of stand everybody up um, as, as a leader in the field and, you know, part of the success of the entire team, you know, I think that's where we really get students that maybe see somebody that looks like them in a role on a ship that they might not be otherwise exploring. Um, and, so, and so that's where our role modeling uh, kind of is really highlighted. Mm, that's great. You know, it struck me as you were sort of sharing a bit about your research, especially your search for Amelia Earhart's plane, one of the things that we often um, really emphasize with students in the biological sciences is the issue of failure and sort of how you learn from that and is it really failure? Maybe you're, you know, learning what, what else are you learning? And I'm just curious if you have kind of thoughts about that in general, in terms of some, that being a challenge in science, that, you know, the resiliency and the ability to continue uh, to pursue the answers to those questions despite multiple um, roadblocks. I'm just curious if you have thoughts about that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that's a very important point. And I often tell students that I work with that, you know, it's really, it's, be a, it's really important to be open to failure and to serendipity. Um, so, you know, I think failure, everybody's going to fail. Um, and it's more important about what you do with that failure and what you learn from that failure um, than the failure itself. Because the failure, you're going to forget about. And, you know, something that you might be thinking as a failure is not actually in the long run a failure at all. It's going to help you grow. It's, you're going to learn from it. You know, in the case of Amelia, we didn't find her, you know, but, you know, it's that I don't see that as a failure at all. Right. Um, you know, it's, it's definitely informing future work. Um, and that, that, that's true on any personal path as well. Fantastic. So I have one other question here. Um, would the U.S. ratifying the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea impact the activities of the trust? 
not right now. No, <laughs> no. So our, our primary mission is really to, um, you know, we've got a pretty direct charge to, to explore um, and characterize the EZ um, within the U.S. boundaries. So um, at, at this point, we don't see that impacting us. Mm -hmm. Great. Congratulations, by the way, on that massive grant. That's amazing. What a, an exciting project. Well, it was a, a lot of leadership from, from the PIs at all those institutions. So it was. I can yeah. imagine. One more question here. Do we know if creatures that live in the cold waters at abyssal depths age more slowly than life in the fast lane on the ocean surface? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know that aging timelines are any different, but they're, they're certainly very different environments. So probably different, uh, different factors playing in, into uh, lifespans, I would imagine. Mm, interesting. A couple more comments here. When there was a 60 minute segment last year with Ray Dalio, the founder of Bridgewater Associates, who, was under, who has underwritten ocean exploration and questioned those funding space exploration as the return on ocean exploration in his mind is so much higher as it's here, as it's here on earth and affects our lives. It sounds like um, maybe you have a busy schedule 2021 20, to 24, but wondering if resources were not an issue, where would you want to go and what would you want to tackle? Oh, that's, that's a really good question. I think one of, I mean, my personal places that I would love to be is the Indian Ocean. I mean, I, there's just geologically so many um, very, very interesting questions to, to answer in the Indian Ocean. Um, but in I, to, to Ray Dalio's kind of point, you know, I, I think it's an important one to make. Um, I think, you know, we, while we put a lot um, of aspirational vision into exploring outer space, um, you know, I think it's, it's exciting to a lot of, you know, everybody can look up and see the stars. Not everybody can, has the, you know, fortune of looking out and seeing the ocean or even the deep sea and really having a fundamental uh, view of what's down there. So I think it's, it's really important for us to continue to engage uh, the broader public on, on why it's so important to have not just the doomsday stories about, you know, ocean and plastics in the ocean, but some of those aspirational stories too that, that really come out of it to, to get people engaged. Terrific. Yeah, I think what you're saying is so important just across science in general, but absolutely in terms of ocean exploration. That's really exciting. One final question. Um, which organizations in the consortium are exploring in areas beyond national jurisdiction? Um, I, I think all of them, um, for sure. So really, I mean, it's, I think each, each of those organizations is certainly has efforts um, both, and partnerships, uh, international partnerships, um, but within, with the NOAA focused work, which is not 100% of any one institution's work, um, that, that is largely focused on, on US EEZ. Um, that being said, um, you know, they're, they're, we have to get from point A to point B, and that's through other people's uh, EEZs and territory. So, you know, we, we definitely tried to, to piggyback on that and, you know, we'll be off Australia and New Zealand or, you know, pretty close. And so, so we do look for those international collaborations as well. That's fantastic. Allison, thank you so, so much for sharing your exciting path with us. Um, I, I just find it fascinating and I I think, I don't know if you have any closing remarks to, you know, in thinking about the students that are with us um, today and just completing their summer fellowship here at MDIBL, any words of wisdom as they think about their path from Maine to beyond and sort of what awaits them if they were to continue in, to pursue a career in science? Yeah, I mean, I, I think my, my advice would be kind of what I mentioned before, just be open to the serendipity. Um, you know, there is no straight or linear path um, to any career um, and just, you know, allow doors to be open for you, um, open them for others behind you and, and just, you know, definitely seek advice from people that you admire and um, want to learn from. So good luck and um, it's, it's, you're going to have an amazing path ahead of you having experience with MDIBL. Fantastic. Thank you so, so much. Really, really appreciate your time today and the great presentation. And I think that's really echoed lots of folks in the comments thanking you for a wonderful presentation. So terrific. Um, as we wrap up, I just want to remind folks on um, our meeting today that we have 
a series of activities planned throughout the remainder of the week as we really shine a spotlight on the amazing work of our students this year here at MDIBL in some rather challenging circumstances as Dr. Haller alluded to their experience here this summer in in the summer of 2020 is very different than that of students who have been here at the past in the past but regardless of that i think they've really done some amazing work and so their continuing poster presentations and then on friday they will be offering what we're calling three minute theses so every student will give just a very brief three minute presentation a summary of their work over the summer that will happen around 10 o'clock in the morning from roughly 10 to 12 and they'll just be a succession of presentations so we encourage you to tune in for that there's information about that on our website if you didn't receive it in your registration email um, should be a great great opportunity to get a glimpse of what some of our students have been working on over the summer. In addition, tomorrow afternoon at four, we will have an alumni roundtable where we'll have four or five um, former students at MDIBL in various career paths, really sharing their experience and uh, talking about kind of different impacts that their time at MDIBL had on them and how that followed them throughout their careers. Then on Friday afternoon at four, we will do a quick sort of virtual tour of the campus for those of you who haven't been back for a while and are curious about some of the changes, the new additions, the buildings, all of that, as well as just um, answering questions that you may have about sort of where we're headed and what the research focus is at the lab. So we encourage you to really stay in touch this week. Um, more than that, I think what we're looking for is to create a regular um, communication platform with our students and really encourage and uh, connect with all of you and, and really celebrate that shared experience that we all have. So as we go through the week, we'll be sending you little reminders, ways that you can stay in touch with us, um, opportunities to share your story. Why is MDIBL important to you? And um, we would love to be able to share that with others. So uh, we'll be in, in contact with you and just want to express our appreciation. It's wonderful to see everyone and we hope that we'll see you throughout the week on these various Zoom um, opportunities. And more importantly, we can't wait to see you in person once COVID is no longer um, a, a big issue for us. So thank you all so much for being with us this afternoon. And thank you to all of our speakers. Really, really appreciate your time.